welcome to Ask a Martian. I'm Orchid Satellite Martian. And I'm Elias Vidal Martian. And we're going to talk to you about fashion style, answer some questions. And we're also going to introduce this episode with a little bit of a difference. What are we going to do, Elias? Uh, we are going to describe what each other are wearing right now. Uh, we thought it would be a fun little segment. So we'll be starting all future episodes with this short little interlude. Are you going to start? Yeah, you want sure. Me to start? Uh, so right now, Orchid is wearing a fluffy, fuzzy pink sweater dress. It's long sleeve and mini dress and a fluffy velvet purple belt with a golden belt buckle, shrimps earrings, and a fluffy pink cheetah print hat and some very kawaii little strawberry socks that, yeah, <laughs> I remember getting those uh, at Bodyline in uh, Takashita Street. Um, yeah, I think you have some velvet boots as well to go along with this ensemble. Oh, yeah. And um, Elias is wearing some pastel American apparel socks. I guess I'm going from bottom to top. And some, like, baby blue and pink rip and dip sweatpants that are pretty rad. They're his new favorite. He wears them all the time. And then a T-shirt from, I don't know when, what year this shirt's from. Do you know? It's the Dark Room. Uh, it used to be, like, a club in San Francisco, but... It, it's significant. I, I think it's like from like 10 years ago or something. Oh, really? It's really um, amazing. It has a graphic of two unicorns on it and a skull and an upside down pink triangle. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And then has matching blue hoodie. So we realized coming in today that we are basically the trans flag because we're or, baby blue and pink and white. Yeah, yeah. Kind of Barbie Ken sort of scenario. Yeah. Very cute in the 80s. It's perfect. Well, uh, should I get started on the first yeah. question? Okay, so we got a question from a listener who's asking us, where do we source unique shoes and vintage shoes? Yeah, um, that that's a fun question because for me, I... I'm a big shoe hoarder, and then there's some shoes that I wear all the time regularly and some that I just look at that are pretty. A lot of those are my vintage ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd say maybe I have 300 pairs of shoes. Do you think more? I think you might have more than that. Yeah, I have a lot of shoes. All right, Imelda Marcos. Yeah, it's a dream. <laughs> um, and Sidebar, Imelda Marcos was the... Prime Minister's wife, uh, first lady of uh, the Philippines, and she is a notorious shoe hoarder. Like, I believe she had thousands and thousands of pairs of shoes. She had just rooms dedicated to shoes. I really admire people like that, like Elton John and his sunglasses room. I want a sunglasses room. That sounds amazing. Yeah, I don't have a shoe room yet, but someday, someday in the future, hopefully it'll happen. I have a shoe wall. I do have a shoe wall. It's pretty well organized. I'm very happy about it. Um, I put them all in bins from the container store um, for numerous reasons, because they're clear and I can see them, keeps them organized. But also, if we're talking about vintage shoes, one of the biggest problems is them dry rotting or breaking on you. Um, you can get them brand new, dead stock, never worn, but, you know, they're from the past, and you can wear them once and they immediately disintegrate. It's the saddest thing. It happens to a lot of shoes I've had in the past where just because they've been sitting there for so long and the way that the air gets to them, you don't realize it until you put your foot in it, but it'll just disintegrate from under you. Yeah, it's so easy for them to be dry rotted or for even like old leather or pleather to be, you know, ripped and cracking and... You know, it's it, it, something can look amazing online. And even the seller, I'm sure, you know, would have no idea if they didn't try it on. Uh, you know, someone can list up this beautiful looking pair of vintage shoes on, on the Internet. And then you you get it. You open that box. You put them on your feet. And that first day out, you go from having shoes on your feet to having no shoes at all. 
This has happened to a lot of people that I know who buy vintage shoes online. It literally happened to me this week. I was wearing an elf outfit and I had had these amazing like green satin heels with a rhinestone tip and I was so excited to wear them. I basically planned the whole outfit after them and immediately walked out the door and the entire heel just broke off. So it happens a lot with used shoes. One of my tricks is I literally, I look like a freak sometimes, but when I'm shopping for used clothes, I'll just like wiggle the bottom of the heel to make sure that it doesn't like come off and just make sure like some people will glue it before they donate it or resale it and you don't realize it and it's just like a tiny bit of shoe glue so you want to check for those things before you wear them out and you yeah them. also flex the sole of the shoe if you can um you know be, to mimic you actually walking in it obviously that's not possible for things like platforms or whatever but uh, it's always a good idea to flex the bottom of the shoe if possible to kind of, you know, see if uh, it can contain your foot. Um, some vintage shoes, too, might seem like, oh, this is just not going to happen. One example of this would be vintage plastic shoes. Um, a lot of people don't realize it, but... Uh, you know, they're really super tight and that plastic just totally constricts over time. One way to get your foot into a clear plastic shoe from the past is by taking a hairdryer and just going over the shoe a few times with the hairdryer. You know, you can use the high or medium heat setting and really just like warm up that plastic before sliding your foot in. And actually, when it you slide your foot in, it will mold to your feet. So it'll be totally comfortable for wearing what might otherwise seem to be like an uncomfortable player, pair of it's clear really plastic heels. It's really magical and transformative. We were just on set recently for this film, and uh, one of the main cast members was wearing, we put her in these amazing uh, like uh, plastic and lucite heels from the late 50s. And they had rhinestones on them. They were so cute. And she was so nervous. She's like, my foot's not going to fit into this. It looks uncomfortable. And then as soon as we, we literally blow dried it on her and she'd never experienced that before. She was like all giggly about it because we had like hot heat on her toes. And um, it, they looked so beautiful. Like she didn't want to take them off. They were so nice. So it's one of those things like it's definitely worth trying. It's a really cool thing. And it feels like the shoe was made for you. Yeah. So that's one way to kind of take it. But um, you know, we really do look for shoes in a vast variety of places. Uh, you know, personally, I think it's a lot better to get shoes in a way where you can try them on uh, just to make sure because really, you know, even though you are an eight and you know that that's your shoe size and you're a true size eight, that doesn't mean that the manufacturer actually made their shoes to be the perfect size for you uh you know that being said if you have a brand that you know fits your feet at a certain size like yeah patronize them you know go back to that same brand looking for other options because you know that their sizing fits you but um in in general i i prefer going to shoe shop in an environment where you can try it on yeah and sizing shoes can be so hard one person that we know personally that does an amazing job finding sh like amazing shoes and sizing them correctly is our friend Danny. she owns a vintage shop called nanometer and she specializes in a lot of footwear vintage footwear and her like attention to detail in sizing the shoe is amazing we recently uh, met a shoe designer also named chris francis and we had a conversation about, you know, how insane it is to, to measure the calf perfectly at certain angles to make sure it fits well. And a big part of just designing a good shoe is getting those measurements. So when you're buying a shoe that's vintage, you don't want to even really look at the sizes that are on the label. You really want to see what the measurement is, how it's going to fit your calf. And, you know, if your foot, because a lot of them run very narrow, too. So, yeah, it gets complicated. Yeah, definitely. If you have a wide foot, vintage footwear is not your jam, probably. No. 
there's just a lot of narrow, narrow shoes that were manufactured in the past. And uh, it can be tricky for a lot of people that, you know, have a, a, a wider foot. But that uh, being said, if you love a vintage style and you have a larger shoe size, there are so many good brands that make vintage inspired shoes. There's a brand called Remix that does amazing shoes, uh, mostly from like the 20s to the 60s and just classic shoe styles that they, they redo and that are modern to all shoe sizes. So it's great too. They make them up to like a men's 14, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, in terms of finding unique shoe brands, uh, I really like looking in magazines from all over the world. So not just looking at stuff from the U.S., but, you know, one of the shoe brands that I know you're a fan of, Orchid, is Mista, M-I-I-S-T-A. They're amazing. Um, And just because of the fit and the the style is really cool. I mean, you know, it's really important to, uh, keep in mind, you know, different sorts of manufacturing processes or, you know, different types of, uh, products that go into your shoe. You know, maybe you don't want to be buying things new. Maybe you want to buy stuff secondhand, uh, and, you know, really, Uh, give that shoe a second chance at life and you know make sure that we are not you know wasting all of these products that are just gonna go into a landfill yeah definitely um i think that's a good way to end it are you ready for the second question sure yay do you want me to ask it yeah yeah okay so our second question we got was it's gonna it's the 20s so do you think 20s fashion will make a comeback Okay, so 20s fashion, I feel like there's not that many people out there that are, like, rocking it on the daily. The same way that you see kind of, like, pinup girls dressing in a, you know, 40s, 50s style. Or, you know, a lot of people wear, like, 60s, 70s retro or, you know, 80s and and 90s is the biggest thing right now. Um, I feel like, in general, you kind of see this, uh, like, 30-year gap or like 20 to 30 year gap in terms of like what's cool again yeah um so like in the 80s they were playing with a lot of 50 silhouettes right and you know you you kind of see that uh that same thing happen where uh you know things get brought back from a previous decade like right now a lot of 90s fashion is like the coolest thing to be wearing. You know, you see a lot of oversized t-shirts, grunge style, you know, hip hop style, uh, things that were really popular back in the 90s coming back again. Um, but the 20s. Yeah, it's really interesting to think about. I think that that decade for me. I have a little bit less of an attachment to than maybe other decades in terms of style, Um, but it doesn't mean that there's not amazing moments in that decade that have played an important role in fashion. And there are certain design elements that I'm definitely seeing in current collections and what designers are doing in terms of like young people and subculture. I don't know. It's, It's interesting. Yeah, uh, I think we've all seen those like flapper or Great Gatsby themed parties that people dress up for. And there's like five million of the same freaking flapper dress on eBay. So if you want that from China, you can make that happen like really quickly. But, you know, I'd be interested to hear from you, Orchid, since you're in an environment where designers are coming in looking um not just for garments to purchase as inspiration for design collections but also looking at fabric do you see designers picking up and gravitating towards maybe 20s prints well absolutely i mean i think that the 20s was that was a very pivotal time for like different embellishing and um ways of messing with fabric I mean, some of the earliest designers that created pleating 
did the most amazing work in the 20s. Um, there were three designers that were like really outstanding, um, Fortuny, Galenga, and Babani. Um, and they all had different like integral designs that we still see today on the runway. Um, there was a lot of really cool like printing and pleating and dyeing of fabrics. Um, a lot of the earliest like tie dyeing and seeing these like rich colors and like dyeing velvets in different hues. That was all done in the 20s. You know, when I've been working at vintage shops since I was like 14 and one of the most common costumes is a flapper girl and you know, going to 20s parties, especially around New Year's, everybody wants that. But what a lot of people don't know is that fringe actually wasn't that common in the 20s. Right, like the flapper aesthetic, like that's one thing that sticks out, but it's kind of like the equivalent of being a go-go dancer in the 60s. Exactly. Not that many people were go-go dancers in the 60s. Exactly. Not that many people were flapper girls And in the it was 20s. a very, very specific part of the 20s, you know? It was Prohibition era, and it was some of the women that would party. Uh, it was a very certain class. It was more the elite. And these were women that could afford the really fine fringe dresses. Um, making fringe back then was really expensive and difficult. Um, but there was also some amazing beadwork that people would wear that I feel like that's what people should be wearing now to you know New Year's parties and to all of the, the 2020 events. The beadwork was extraordinary. Um, some of the innovations in mesh and how they would lay beads on, incredible. And that's why a lot of these dresses still survive after 100 years. You can still get a lot of beautiful 20s gowns um, at lots of vintage shops all over the world it's pretty amazing yeah one thing I remember is like you know empire waists or drop waists and you know where like a garment would not necessarily have a specific you, you know waist but would rather have a band going around you know somewhere maybe even below the hips uh, and then having a skirt coming off of that. So it was, you know, not as much of a focus on, um, you know, accenting a, a woman's, you know, bust and and her hips uh, the same way that you would have seen around the turn of the century, especially uh, in the late 1800s. There was a whole lot of corsetry going on during that time period and then after world war one you really see a move away from that sort of tight silhouette towards a more open uh flowing boxier silhouette that i i think you see a lot in women's fashion in the in the 20s yeah i mean it's important to note that kind of like the 60s the 20s was a really freeing time for women um, with, the, with the politics happening, especially in the United States and Europe. And it did allow for the clothing to represent that. A lot of people that know of fashion history know of Coco Chanel's role in kind of freeing the woman of uh, this, this typical form that was really constricted and being able to wear looser garments, to be able to wear menswear. Um, and with some of the innovations and the jobs that were coming out for women, this changed a lot of their outfits too. So it was pretty incredible to see um, and to see some of the looks of these, these women that are wearing looser garments, less like constricting undergarments underneath. Um, it was really amazing. Yeah, I mean, some undergarments would literally just be a camisole. Right. And uh, let me tell you, a camisole is a hell of a lot easier to get in and yeah. <laughs> to wear versus an 1890s corset, which could literally have, you know, 30 holes in it that need to be laced up. Yeah. And frequently you need help getting into right yeah it's so pretty insane. wild it's crazy but yeah i guess in terms of what we're gonna see for you know the 2020s it's gonna be interesting i think a lot of it's gonna have to do with textiles and surface design in terms of 
like fashion on the runway. But then also I hope it's still going to be, you know, freeing clothing for women, women wearing undergarments as outer garments and things like that. Um, I think it's beautiful. And I think that's what, you know, women should feel free and able to wear loose clothing, menswear, things like that. So I hope that that continues. And that's really popular. Yeah. Plus people love the bling bling. They oh, love yeah. The, a little bit we of We love the shine. silk, the velvet, yeah. the, the paillettes, all of that. Absolutely. Okay, so for the last question uh-huh. we have from a listener, uh, says, I'm trying to grow up and not just wear band t-shirts all the time. How can I show my musical taste without wearing just band t-shirts? I love this. Do you want to start? Um, Sure. Yeah, I don't know. I kind of feel like many people went through a phase in their life where they're like, yeah, like I shop at Hot Topic. Oh, like, I certainly did. You know, or like I have this cool band t shirt that, you know, this one band only gave out on their, you know, this part of the tour. And like I'm a cool kid because, you know, I was at these like cool shows. Oh, yeah. But like, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I have to say, I'm not that person anymore. Not that I don't own band t shirts, but like, you know, I'm no longer a punk rocker, although I do listen to punk rock. And, uh, you know, what? maybe I am at heart, but I definitely don't dress that way anymore. I think the band t-shirt is such an important part of, like, how we interact. And it sounds silly, but, I mean, that's kind of what got me into fashion at the beginning was music and music's role in fashion and I always thought like I wanted to be a musician but really I just wanted to dress up like a musician Um, so I got more into the act of dressing than actually practicing my instrument but I always wear band t-shirts to try to be cool and to try to express like what my interests are and I think it's still important today for everybody um, but there's ways to do it without just wearing a band t-shirt. Yeah uh, one thing I would say is like look at the people in the bands you're listening to and maybe take some style cues from them. Obviously not every musician is a sharp dresser. There's a lot of style uh, fails and a lot of people that maybe you should pay a stylist um, like me th- that are in the <laughs> <laughs> we're available for hire. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> It in the musical community, but I would say overall, go ahead and take a look at the people that are in the bands that you are listening to and see how they dress. Now, I'm not talking about, okay, if you listen to Guar and, you know, d- don't do that, okay? They can wear pig's blood if they want to. Oh, don't God. shame on that. Anyway, <laughs> um, but, like, for example, maybe you're into you know, 60s mod music and, you know, like look at the the people that are making it. Go look at old photos and try to find something for yourself that's similar and and just, you know, try it on without the pressure of it being your new look. You know, maybe start swapping out uh, the t-shirts for, you know, something more like a tunic or uh, some type of overshirt or at least pairing your t-shirts with some type of over shirt, over button up shirt, um, that has a little bit more style and flair and fun. Um, I know that I'm a really big fan of patterns and a lot of people in the rock and roll community love wearing patterns. Uh, you know, like zebra or some type of animal print or even cooler doing an artist designed print, um, you know, supporting local artists, local community, uh, designers. I think that's always a wonderful thing to do. And so you can always branch out from your graphic tee, uh, and try something that is, you know, maybe an artistic tee instead of uh, a band t-shirt. Yeah, and if you still want 
people to know what kind of music you like. If you dress to a similar style of the music, people are going to, they're going to respond to that and they're going to ask you questions, um, especially if you listen to certain genres. You know, there's so many different signifiers in how you dress that can tell people like, oh, I really like this music genre. Um, depending on the genre, of course, certain genres might be hard to dress like. But there's other things you can wear too, not just t-shirts. You can wear buttons, you can wear patches, um, you can embellish your pants. You can, there's so many cool like ways to showcase bands on garments. It's something I used to do a right. lot when I was younger. Yeah, I mean, not everyone who's listening to Lil' Kim is going to be able to like go pull off a, you know, one arm pastel purple flower nipple situation that was a good look though um, everyone should try to pull that off yeah i mean like if you don't know that look you need to google lil kim's purple oh, honestly look. all of lil kim's looks oh yeah they just, were great like, literally yeah. there's so many of them yeah. it's really it's really hard to even say and that being said too like if you have a t-shirt with lil kim on it like that you, you should wear that t-shirt i mean you should wear those band t-shirts and band t-shirts can be incredible um but there's yeah, maybe, ways to maybe look at the ones that you have and see okay look this one was printed in 2005 from hot topic maybe we don't need that but the other one you have over there now that's an original concert t-shirt so like Maybe you hang on to that one or maybe you sell it on eBay and make a pretty penny on it. Definitely. Yeah. And there's different ways to wear t-shirts too and tuck them in so they look cool with like maybe more of a high-waisted trouser. Um, for You can also wear oversized t-shirts as dresses. I used to do that a lot with like fishnets and it was really cool. Um, there's, you know, there's ways to make t-shirts not just look like a boring band t-shirt. And also you can embellish them or give them more wear to look them more, to look more interesting. Please don't destroy your early vintage dead stock band t-shirts though. I see it so much. It makes me so sad. Are you talking about like where people will just like be like, this is a crop top now yeah. or like cut like, you out know, the... Uh, th off the top of it and just be like, yep, this is a V-neck crop top. And you're like, actually, that shirt would have been worth a lot of money and also is super rare if you hadn't just taken your pair of craft scissors to it and given it a new hemline. And that could be a whole nother episode is authenticating vintage t-shirts. It's something actually I did for years and I did trainings on um, in terms of like knowing the screen print and like the way that the t-shirt is woven and the tags from the manufacturers. Um, I can nerd out a lot about t-shirts origins and what band t-shirts are the most valuable. Um, I have a pretty amazing collection myself of a lot of punk and rock and roll t-shirts, and it's really hard to give them up. But yeah, I don't wear t-shirts much anymore. So uh, I wonder if you could give our listeners like maybe three pointers to identify what is a reprint shirt versus uh, an actually old band t-shirt. The tag is pretty vital. Um, the tag that's on the inside of the garment, it'll tell you a lot based on the wear of it, the, the like graphic design or like the print on the tag itself and the material. Um, and then, so if it says Gildan, Gildan, it depends though. It depends right? on, yeah, it's hard. Um, cause they'll take, oh, see, we could go on and on. It's so hard. Um, there's. So much to vintage t-shirts. Another thing is just the screen print quality. Um, depending on, of course, how big the band was, they could hire um, companies to print their t-shirts in really nice quality. And some of them were totally DIY. They'd print them themselves and they would be really messy, um, a thicker puffy paint. Um, I love the ones that date themselves. However, the modern ones, they can still put a date of 1985 on the screen print, and you think they're from 1985, but they're not. So, God, there's there's just so many. I mean, there's things to watch out for, for sure, online. So, like, let's say you're trying to go find, uh, like, let's say you're trying to go find a, hi, how are you, Daniel Johnson shirt, and you go and type that in to eBay, 
And wow, holy balls, there are so many of them available for nineteen ninety nine coming from China. You know, and you know for sure that those ones are all reprints because uh, the original ones that you see scattered throughout are usually quite a bit more expensive than that. And uh, usually they probably don't all just have the same generic picture for each of them. So things to watch out for. Yeah. And just the quality of the t-shirt too. Um, A lot of the ones in the 70s and 80s, they didn't have a side seam. They would be a full wrap around in how they were woven. So when you look on a t-shirt, you'll see a lot under the armpit, there's the seam. Ones without a seam are usually a sign of a better quality shirt. So if it's a nice green print with no seam and a tag that looks vintage, there's there's a good chance that you have a really cool vintage t-shirt. Yeah. Maybe this is a, a, a content for a future episode where we'll do a deeper dive into the world of the vintage tea. Oh, yeah. And there are so many good ones. The graphics. Oh, my gosh. Punk t-shirt graphics are some of my favorite. I have books and books of them. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. So on that note, Let's uh, give some thanks really quickly Absolutely. to our producer, editor, all around angel, Josh McFeedy, aka DJ Mellow Code. He is also the composer for our music, and we appreciate him so much. Absolutely. We also just want to take a moment to plug our YouTube channel. Martian Family Values. You can go on YouTube and type in Martian Family Values. Go ahead and watch our videos. Subscribe. Hit that like button. Hit that comment button. Hit that notification button. Do all of those things. And you can also listen to this podcast right at that YouTube channel as well. Yeah. We are also everywhere podcasts are listened to and hosted. So feel free to tell your friends and family and your followers about everything the Martian family is doing. Yeah, thank you guys so much for listening and we look forward to the next episode. Here's the Martian family. Last night.